I will talk to you about a, a question that has bewildered us, and I will tell you the journey that we have taken uh, regarding the issue which you're all busy with, which is how things like maternal interaction define phenotypes for a lifetime, and perhaps even transgenerationally. And also, these relationships, of course, don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a big social, economic, physical environment, all of which, as you all know, has immense implications on the phenotype. I was trained in genetics and biochemistry. For us, everything has to come somewhere from the genes. And since it was hard to explain all these things by just inheritance, to raise the question, how can one DNA uh, represent experiential information? The field of epigenetics is 70 years old. Actually, it was founded by uh, <laughs> in, in the 40s, and the, uh, the idea of epigenetics was understanding how one DNA that we carry as a multicellular organism can express itself in millions and millions of phenotypes, but not only that, it expresses itself in time and in space. So DNA has a script somehow uh, for the future of the life of that animal. And the, and, and the term epigenetics was coined to explain it, and 70 years of biochemistry uh, has uh, unraveled the secrets of epigenetics. We will focus on, let's see how it works, on the DNA methylation marks that punctuate the genome. And to explain it very easily, if I take a DNA from a mummy that died 5,000 years ago, and I sequence it, I will get the ancestral information, the ethnic background. Did he come from Canaan? Is he, is he really Egyptian? Did he come from Africa? Things like that. But I can also sequence his methylation pattern. And I can tell without any error what tissue that DNA comes from. So DNA has two identities. We know that for 70 years. It has genetic ancestral identity, and it has cellular identity. And in the brain, perhaps every neuron has a different identity. So you have perhaps millions of different identities on top of the common ancestral identity. So the question I want uh, to ask is perhaps the same mechanism that confers upon DNA numerous identities that is very well established biochemically, perhaps the same mechanism serves to imprint uh, experiential information in the DNA. Let me see if I can work the technology. So methylation of DNA is amazingly simple, attractive, and complex at the same time. So all it has to do is with a little chemical modification, a methyl group sitting on this position of cytosine, which has dramatic, dramatic consequences for gene expression, especially if it's located at very strategic position. It can shut down the gene, it can shut down the gene a million fold. So without any changing the sequence, you can by this uh, modification change, uh, change function dramatically. We know now about more modifications that there's still a mystery of what they do biochemically, and I will not talk about it. However, after I told you this fantastic story that methylation shuts down gene expression, many of you who dabbled with correlating gene expression and DNA methylation know that that correlation is not perfect. But the way you did it is very, very informative. The way you did it is you crushed the brain, Perhaps even you took laser capture of millions of neurons, you crushed them, you measured the RNA, and then you took the DNA and measured methylation. And what you'll see many times is like this gene. It's highly methylated when you crush the tissue. And this is the RNA polymerase II binding. High, highly expressed. 
And when you look at the genome, this is from the prefrontal cortex of a mouse. When you do it, you will see many, many genes that are like that. So this could be a grand killer or force you to think deeper about the sin of crushing a tissue and learning correlating functions by doing that. So, our hypothesis was that actually when you crush a million neurons, each of these neurons is expressing genes in a different way. So can we ask the question, the genes that are actually working in that million neurons that you crushed, are they methylated or not? And we can do it by a technique called chip sequencing. So we can take an antibody to RNA pol 2 and actually pull down those molecules of DNA in that brain that are actually working at the moment that we killed the mouse and ask the question, what is their state of methylation? And when you do that, you see all no methylation. So what's happening here is that actually 98% of the neurons are methylated and silent, and 2% are doing all the activity. So when you measure DNA methylation, you get really a digital signal, because you know a gene could be either methylated or not, there's no half methylation. And of course, there are multiple copies, there will be half, but in one copy of one allele, there will be. But the RNA is an analog signal. <clears throat> so this is the first thing to understand. Now think about it. What a tremendous plasticity it gives to the brain. So not only you can methylate this gene in that tissue, but you can decide how many cells are methylated, how many not. How many neurons in the hippocampus are currently methylated and how many not? And by this defining which of these are potentially expressible. So that's principle number one. And this has been something that has caused us a lot of trouble because we come from the field of cancer. In cancer, you take a tumor, and a tumor is also heterogeneous, by the way, <laughs> but the differences in methylation between a tumor and a normal tissue is just Tremendous, because most of the cells in the tumor are very similar. Then you take a brain that learns something, and you expect that the changes will be the same. And this gives us an answer why, how it works. Individual neurons uh, are activating and suppressing methylation. So the next interesting question is the difference between DNA methylation and gene expression. And there's a philosophical difference that is extremely important. When you measure gene expression, you're taking a snapshot of what the brain does at the moment that you kill the animal. When you're measuring DNA methylation, you're measuring the probe. So many genes, we carry many genes in our brain that work perhaps once in our lifetime, for five seconds in our lifetime. And these genes, can save our life when we stand on the bridge and decide whether to commit suicide or not. But if you look at a basal state, you don't see any difference in activity. These genes are activated, for example, by glucocorticoid hormones, by, by, by estrogens, and by numerous other cytokines. They are activated only when you need them. But the difference between individual A and individual B is not in gene expression, but in the propensity for genes. So epigenetic programming don't, doesn't only define <coughs> the situation now, it actually gives you a movie for the future. It defines the potential activity of the brain down the line. And this is something that we always mix, and, uh, and in a very, I think, naive way, when you study just gene expression. <laughs> So of course one can ask, why do we have all these levels of regulation? It's because our genes don't only work in one time dimension, they work in multiple time dimensions, and they work in multiple contexts. That's why RNA expression is not always correlated with protein expression. Because you have a lot of RNA, you get a little signal, you can make protein. If you don't have the RNA, you need to make the RNA. So all these things define different levels of regulation and different levels of genomic plasticity that are fantastic to explain how experience is shaping the genomics of the brain. So based on that, we, offer, we suggested around a decade ago 
two elements. First, that these changes in methylation, the difference from changes in genetics, are physiological changes. They are not random um, Mendelian mutations that happen in human evolution that you're looking to correlate, associate with disease. They are physiological responses to experience. And experience is not limited to the brain. And actually, experience comes in packages. And we see it all over medicine. There's the bioenvironment which is becoming very important. We realize how microbes are important in shaping our brain. The immune system, which mediates the response to the bioenvironment, is becoming more and more important. And I almost say, in your institute, you should have immunologists, because I don't see how you can study psychology without studying immunology. And, of course, the physical environment, which is the amount of food, which defines metabolism, which define how we react to food, of course, the brain reacts to food. Your hypothalamus decides whether to binge or not. But also, your metabolic tissues decide what to do with the food. And all of this cannot be anticipated by evolution. A little of it is anticipated. So we suggested that all this happens mostly during early life. It acts for signaling pathways, so it doesn't work just by chance. And it modulates the genome to fit bioenvironment, physical environment, social environment as an integrated environment. And I'll show you evidence that it's very legitimate to study immunology in the context of psychology. And all of this eventually defined on health. However, this is all good. Methylation is not bad. There are so many papers published about methylation with disease that everybody thinks methylation is a curse. Methylation is not a curse. Just because the NIH funds disease, we think that everything is a curse. Methylation, I believe, although I don't have evidence, is definitely evolutionary um, selected to increase fitness, to allow a, an organism, especially a complex organism like a human, to survive in multiple experiences, multiple environments. And it's very clear that the methylation profile of humans is much more complicated and complex than even the mouse. And if you go in the primate ladder, you can see as the primate becomes more complex, more big, your methylation becomes more complex. And I'll give you one example. Ribosomal RNA in the mouse has one methylated group, and the human has 20 something. So even though in evolution we lose CGs, the promoters we gain CGs. And it makes sense. The more complex the organism, the more need the organism has to amplify to the response. So, <laughs> we wanted to address the question whether it's legitimate. By the way, epigenetics in psychology has no hope if only the brain is the substrate that you're going to study, right? Because nobody's going to donate pieces of their hippocampus for your longitudinal studies. Uh, but people will give you saliva and blood so you can follow them. So question number one, is the theory right that a response to a social stress is not just in the brain. Essentially, are people mindless bodies or bodiless minds, or they are minds and bodies together? So there was a tremendous opportunity to address, it, address this question uh, with a colleague of mine, who all know Steve Sumi, and we looked at his maternally, maternally reared versus salivary reared monkeys. First, we had an opportunity to sacrifice older monkeys, and we found methylation differences between those who were reared by your mother and those that were not reared by your mother. And for me, this was like almost a revelation of the mother's signature in the gene. And the second thing we found was that the differences were not limited to the brain. And it occurred also in the immune system. So in this case, we compared prefrontal cortex and, and blood. So once we knew that it's legitimate to ask the question, what does maternal care do to your immune system, we can now follow longitudinally and ask the question, first of all, when does it appear? How early? Is it just a consequence of all the things that happened to an animal that was reared with and without a mother? Or is it very early precursor of what happens? So we started taking blood at day 14, and you can see here, 
this clustering of maternally reared versus nursery reared animals, and just for those who are not initiated, uh, each column here is, is a different monkey, and each row here is a different promoter. And the colors just hold the level of methylation. So this clustering is very similar to what I see when I try to differentiate liver cancer from normal liver. But here the difference is between having a mother or not for 14 days. So the antibiotic is quite good. The second question that is really important is originally we naively thought, based on our work on maternal care in rats, that the, the mother creates a signal of methylation in the brain that remains focused. And that creates this genomic memory. But of course, there's another model that you have one trajectory of methylation changes, and the lack of a mother changes the trajectory. So the changes in methylation that you see when the, when the monkey is old is not the same that you saw when the monkey was born and, and, and removed from its mother, but there is a difference in trajectory. So now we can ask these questions, right? Because we can now study living animals, we study safe living animals, and for a long time. So the first thing we discovered and, and here, the code is different. Here, we measure the differences from the basal state, which for us was day 14, the earliest state we could think about. And, and the ex intensity of the color reflects the intensity of change in methylation between uh, horse and, and later on. And you can see changes happening throughout development, both in males and females. But you also see big differences between males and females. And actually, I think it's commonly accepted that epigenetically, males and females are different organs. And the differences are not limited to sex hormones or to classical sex responsive genes. Of course, they somehow they are distantly connected to sex hormones, but they're everywhere. This is the immune system, not the magical system that you think there should be differences between males and females. And, and then I'll show you. So, this is a normal trajectory. So, Answer to question one, there is a trajectory. You don't have the same methylation pattern when you're two and a half years old, in, in this case already adolescent, and when you're born. So you, doesn't seem as a surprise to us, who thought that life ends at birth, uh, that was a huge surprise. It's very hard to get to review this, and methylation changes up. Because if you look at the journal of Gene and Development, which was a classic genetic development journal, I don't think you'll find a paper, uh, you know, very much of it. So development essentially ends after birth, everything is set up there, and so we have an idea that even a normal animal changes. And then we add, calculate into it the effect of maternal separation. So both in the female and males, there is a strong effect of maternal separation, which you see with the intensity of the color. Intensity of the colors. And here's the measure of how many genes are differentially methylated that are common to males and females, only in females, only in males. One thing we notice is, two things we notice. First of all, before, after weaning, the difference between the animals who were separated from their mother normally or late in life and those who were separated from their mother at 14 days almost disappears, suggesting that there are common pathways where maternal separation is working, whether you are 14 days old or, or, or two years old. But at the same time, of course, there is still a difference left, which is the signature of the fact that you didn't have them. So we're talking about the dynamic interaction that occurs in time that has its own, it's like a movie that has a script, and you remove one actor, which is the mother, from the movie, and of course the movie will evolve. But the movie will, but the movie at script number three, scene number three, will not be the same at scene number one, but it will be different than if you didn't remove the mother earlier. So when you do a, an overlap between the uh, genes that are changing with weaning to the genes that are changed with artificial weaning at day 14, you see a tremendous overlap, but you also see the differences. And these are essentially the signatures of the separation that happened early in. So we all carry those signatures in our genome. It's much easier to study in, in monkeys, but the question is, is it true for humans? 
we wanted to know how poorly it happens. And we wanted to know whether the animal has to sense the social separation, the social status. So after 14 days, the animal already is sensitive to the fact that he doesn't have another. And I don't have to tell you that. But what happens at birth? Is already our already social structure determined at birth. So in this case, we compare animals, monkeys of different rank. I love looking at ranking in monkeys because, as I always say, it always reminds me academic departments. And uh, of course, academic departments always rank themselves, journals rank themselves, everybody has to rank themselves, and that's evolutionary and very conserved. And those who rank you know, those who publish always in nature are healthier than those who publish in low impact journal. And the same is true for monkeys, right? And so the top monkeys are healthier than the bottom monkeys. And we asked, what happens to the placenta of a, you know, high ranking first class monkey and a placenta of a low ranking So, first the placenta is very important. And you can see those large differences in that way very large, even stronger than the effect of maternal separation. So already when you're born, it seems, we already carry in our genome the social history of our family. And the next question we ask is how many genes, so there are thousands of genes there, how many genes do we need to predict what social status you came from? And so we did penalized aggression and we found that if the two genes are sufficient, very, very good prediction, and they all also predicted the middle class, which we didn't have in equation. So not only they predict the low class and the upper class, but they also predict the middle class. So since these are also predictors of risk, I hope that these things might one day help in psychiatry uh, treatment to assess, you know, early, early life risks and, and, and apply appropriate interventions. The next uh, pet study that I had was uh, the correct mice. So of course, I was always warned by my teachers not to study the mice. Actually, because they're too complicated. Actually, when I was a graduate student, I was warned not to study mice, because they're too complicated. Stick to lambda fish, you know? Few genes, you can really know what's going on. Why waste time of complexity? And this is, of course, the reduction in science into physics, into bi biology. And the problem with, uh, if I take you and try to call it your methylation pattern to your maternal history, and I probably will have very interesting results, people will say, what, what are you doing? You know, like, you're so different from each other, come from different places, have different genetic backgrounds. How do we randomize child abuse? We can't. And so, how do we study whether child abuse causes changes in methylation, or methylation, or changes in methylation will cause the genetics that cause the child abuse, etc. So my colleague Suzanne King at the Douglas Institute of McGill has a very interesting way of looking at these questions by using God's experiments, which is natural disasters. So whenever there is a disaster, she's there. And you know, the Iowa flood, the Australian flood, and the biggest disaster in Quebec was the ice storm of 1990. It's considered the largest natural disaster in Canadian history, the worst in Canadian history. And, uh, and of course, you can imagine that if you're a pregnant mother during the dead of the Canadian winter without electricity, it is stressful. Nobody died, because Canada is a very organized country and everybody found themselves in shelter. So nobody was cold, but there was stress. And so she developed a measure, of an objective measure of stress, and I compared this to the methylation profile of children who are 15 years old, looked at their T cells, and they correlated it by Pearson correlation to the quantitative measures of stress. And as you can see is that uh, you have a group of genes that lose methylation and a group of genes that gain methylation with stress. But the beauty of the study was, and there were many studies that followed, which I want to talk about, is that we also have phenotypic data and we could do mediation analysis and ask questions, which of these methylation changes are causal? And what's interesting when you look at these kids, the phenotypic differences are the three environments that I was talking about. They have problems with controlling glucose and, and fat, 
high incidence of autism, which is a social phenotype, and high incidence of asthma and either other atopic diseases, which is the immune phenotype. So the bioenvironment, social environment, and physical environment are acting together and legitimizing that whole, our, our approach. And indeed, here I wanted to know if I can make, create a polygenic score that I can give to a, a person and predict the early life stress that his mother is, is suffered from. And this is just a game now, but uh, as you can see, these are very large, large effects and, uh, and very highly predictive. And I truly believe that one day they will be using clinical practice. And we will have a dose uh, very recently. And of course, uh, those I can't talk about all the studies, but this was an interesting approach. So the next question, now that we established that social issues, whether it's stress, separation from mother, um, can have consequences that of course are beyond the brain, but are systemic one. The question is, how is it possible? Right? You know, you study very carefully and very accurately particular circuit, circuitry in the brain, and I use this completely wild approach uh, of looking at immune cells uh, to tell you what happens to the brain. So how is it possible? And actually, it's not hard to imagine. And of course, the field of endocrinology has taught us that what happens in the brain has consequences all over the body. And of course, glucocoid receptors come up as candidate number one. Now we know also microRNAs that are secreted in the brain can go to other places. So there are many ways by which the brain can communicate. So, and I have no doubt that the brain is sensing stress, not the immune system, that then glucocorticoids are secreted. So we ask the question, so this is our hypothesis. So exposure experiences activate signaling pathways in the brain, which then activate hormones. These are systemically distributed and can alter phenotypes from A to B. So why glucocorticoid is our first guy to start with because there is biochemistry going back to the early 80s that glucocorticoids are epigenetic modifiers and create what we call genomic memory so they can modify the chromatin and leave it for life. So we use a genetic approach to ask the question. So we say if this hypothesis is true, then if an animal has half the amount of glucocorticoid receptor, should have a different methylation pattern than an animal that has a full uh, load of glucocorticoid receptor genes. So what we have are heterozygous animals in the womb of a wild animal. So we rule out the, the mother's glucocorticoid and we have the child. And so we also started getting interested in sex, which I must admit, my studies in my first 30 years of my career only worked on males, right? And the reason was not because we wanted to bias females. First, because we assumed that males and females are the same. And, and second, uh, we didn't have any hormonal issues that we had uh, in, 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 in females. So finally, we realized they are females. And so if you look at the wild type, and you look at the placenta, you can see very small differences in the placenta between males and females. This was done by bisulfite capture array bisulfite sequence. However, if you look at the glucocorticoid receptor female heterozygous and compare it to the heterozygous, you can see numerous changes in the DNA. So definitely the glucocorticoid receptor genes is critical for your methylation. In the old days, we would call it the methylase, right? Because it changes methylation. Now we're smarter, knowing that if you change a gene and you get a phenotype, it doesn't mean that this gene is doing the phenotype. It's doing many other things in between. But the glucocorticoid receptor is important. Then you look at the male, you can see differences as well. But you can immediately notice that they're not always the same, and actually, they go the opposite direction. <coughs> So the placenta of a male or a female whose mother, who had 50% of the genetic load of glucocorticoid receptor is very different. And when you compare the two, you get massive differences. So what we see here is that 
and a G by sex interaction. The glucocorticoid receptor deficiency has a wildly different effect in males than it has in females, and in such a primitive tissue as a placenta, even before everything else is settled. So I think that we, we, we of course, have these mice uh, stress, and, and, uh, and it's a very, very complicated study, but I just wanted to focus on the glucose, and then we can, of course, measure stress by the glucose receptor, but it gets so complicated that it's very hard to find any, uh, you know, any significant things. The last thing I want to talk to you about is what are the implications of this? So I come from a department of pharmacology, and our main drive is to make drugs and to increase the wealth of the Canadian population and uh, by creating more drugs. And when I was 30 years old, and when, and the idea was that only drugs are worth money, diagnostics is not worth money anymore. Today, everybody's talking about preventiveness, so diagnostics are becoming the big thing. So I showed you an example of where methylation could go in the area of diagnostics. And we're starting to see if we can actually materialize these markers as useful markers. But the other area that I want to show you is how to change the way that we look at therapeutics, or brain therapeutics. So experience is not limited, of course, to, uh, to early life. We experience a lot of things throughout life. And uh, for example, if somebody, if somebody injured us, we can get chronic pain. If we were traumatized, we can get PTSD. These are all experiences that happen late in life and have long, long life consequences. And uh, one experience is addiction. And I can talk about all three of them, but I wasn't given the whole day. So I'll focus on addiction. This is a project we did in collaboration in Israel with Gali Adit at Barnard University. But I think I think it is just as an example before I believe epigenetic therapies can go. So the model that Gali Adit is using, I like it. He's uh, training the, uh, the rats to uh, admit itself and it's okay. And then he leaves them to a period of a rehab, a withdrawal period. And then when he gives them the cue, uh, again, uh, they become super addicted. So lesson number one, rehab is not necessarily the best solution for addiction, because it seems a lot of things happen when you withdraw the animal. For me, it was fantastic, because, you know, that a chemical exposure like cocaine can change methylation, I don't think it's big news. But the fact that you leave a, a rat in a cage for a month and you get dramatic changes in methylation, where there's no chemical exposure, the rat is behaving like regular, everything is regular, except the fact that it doesn't get the cocaine it used to get. This is for me the news. And then we ask the question, so I would bewilder you now with all the methylation and data. And I'll just give you we followed the progression of changes in methylation throughout this period. For example, uh, this is the metabotropic glucocorticoid receptor number three, and these are the changes in methylation that happen. Interesting thing, changes in methylation happen with a Q. Uh, <coughs> I apologize for uh, this. Uh, probably has to do with the fact that I didn't sleep uh, last night because I wasn't playing. But, uh, this is what happens in motoric coordination when you're tired. So it's a good illustration of some basic physiology. But, uh, but here you can see the, uh, the changes in methylation that happen just by giving a cue after the incubation. So to summarize, the incubation here created massive changes in methylation, much more than the cocaine exposure itself. And the cue, just giving the light, creates also a massive changes in methylation. So we looked at all the changes in methylation, and ask the question, if I now change methylation in the brain, can I reverse the addictive state? So this is a terrible way to do science. Because I teach my students in pharmacology, you always get the crystal structure. You put the crystal structure in, in the modeling, and you get the ultimate drug that hits that structure. And what I'm going to do is a crime. Because I'm going to use a very dirt methylation inhibitor. And so what we did is we asked the question. So if this is our very simplistic hypothesis, 
This is the profile of methylation that creates a normal state. This is the profile of methylation that creates an addictive state. And we reverse it by shocking the system with a DNA methylation inhibitor. Or, do the opposite, give a methyl donor and see if we can shock the system in the opposite way. The other thing we did is we turned it with a behavioral intervention, which in this case is the light. But that's exactly what the cognitive therapist does when he reminds when you do re-exposure, right? You are kind of reminding the animal. It's a very primitive way of exposure. But what we've learned is that that light cue is very, very important. So the drug doesn't work if we don't pair it with, with the light, and we can figure that out why. So if you treat the rats immediately after training, you get almost no. So the uh, the, uh, the, the treatment after cocaine exposure is not very impressive. However, if you treat the rat after withdrawal and you pair that treatment with the cue, you get a very dramatic effect. But the other interesting thing about epigenetics, now think about it. If our hypothesis is the experience of cocaine and the experience of withdrawal has created a profile of methylation that now dictates a new phenomenon, if we remove that profile, we remove the fingerprint. This is not like giving a, an antagonist. This is a completely different way of dealing with it. This is like removing the problem. And therefore, it should not repent unless we give them cocaine again. And indeed, after 60 days, the animals still had the same lower uh, level uh, of uh, craving as 30 days. And this was a single application. I think that's the attractive thing about, you know, starting to treat with epigenetic therapies. We did harm as well. So if we use the SNNs of the diet, we enhance the addiction. These animals became super addictive. And then if you look at the genetic profile, and you can look at the genes that change, and, and this is what we predicted. So this brings me to the end of, of the story. I don't know if I, ha I have ten minutes. I have ten minutes, so we'll have ten minutes for discussion. And uh, of course, we need to do acknowledgments. And I, I always like to say that it's all my work. And in spite of these people, I managed to do this work. <laughs> of course. And so, uh, you know, the different people uh, spend a lot of effort on this. And, and, uh, and I will mention here, uh, Suzanne King and the cow for the ice storm, uh, Renault and Nadine for the monkey, and Michael and Matt helped us with bioinformatics, and Galiadine and his group uh, for the uh, working on the on the uh, on the rats, and Peter Gass and Michael Schmidt working on the glucocorticoid receptor in my university. Of course, uh, the granting agencies. Thank you. So the reason I didn't do it is because I thought that's old stuff. And, uh, and uh, I've done it so many times that I'm, I'm, I'm getting boring myself. <laughs> but uh, of course, I think most of you know the literature. So the, the field, of course, started with experiments and uh, looking at the relationship between the turtle looking at rats and phenotype later in life. And we found that DNA methylation is hippocampus is altered by a thermal Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful book. And we are trying to wrap my head around it. Now, Larry uh, spoke in the morning. Separation, even in a normal period, is 
has a dramatic has a dramatic effect on the population profile. So we all experience maternal loss at some time. Some of us are here and some of us very late, but we all ex experience maternal loss. And I think it's a very interesting area of research, like the effect of weaning. Of course, weaning comes also when puberty starts, and you know, it's, it's, we have to confound it with puberty, which has also a dramatic effect uh, on the DNA methylation problem. So you're talking about multiple, multiple events. A loss, we never studied a loss model except the maternal loss. And maternal loss is confounded by other things that the mother is doing. So losing a mother is not just losing a mother, she has a lot of functions uh, that are lost. It's not like losing a friend, it's very different. But of course, my anticipation will be that, that loss is lost and it will have its, its, its impact because anything that will release local corticoids uh, will change methylation and will have it in the I don't think the loss is an active insult. I think it's the stress. Yeah, it's the stress associated with the loss. Uh, I think that the mother is a mediator of environment in mammals, right? So the mother really signals to the uh, child what is the world that we're living in. Um, you know, is it is it a, a world with with hard life and you better be anxious and better binge every ounce of food you're eating? and a lot of fights, so better have a hyper-reactive immune and inflammatory system? Or is it the world of upper class, where you better be socially cool, not temper temperamental, not hyper-anxious, behave really nice? And so it's very interesting, and Michael talks about it a lot, is that if you take the low licking and grooming rats, and we put them in the wild, they will do much better than the high -licking. And, and also, you can mimic it in, in vitro, right? So the LPP model of learning of a, of a hippocampus slice of a low rat is less than the higher rat, so the learn less. But if you add a little glucocorticoids, the low learn better. The low learn better. So having a hyper-anxious phenotype is not necessarily bad. In the jungle, it will save your life. It's just we're looking at it from a perspective of a middle class society that wants all the kids to look the same, all the judges to behave the same way, everybody has to be the same and behave according to similar standards. They, and, and I think the big lesson, and I heard that, so the big lesson is we're teaching our kids. And you know, the Hanokla Nara Pita quote, which we don't follow, which is, you know, you have to teach the kid based on their early life experiences. And, and you have to expose them to different, different environments, and then you'll get the best. So I think the message of this field is misinterpreted to say that you know, the low animal is, is really bad, or the monkey without a mother is really bad. He's not bad. He's now, you, he has been trained to live in a world that is very harsh. And, and, and of course, if you put that monkey in a cage in Maryland, uh, that monkey will develop metabolic disease and other problems. But if we put them in the jungle, the monkey will do very well because he's prepared to get this kind of thing. Yeah.